Hey, good morning. I want to suggest to you what I think might be the single most dangerous word in the English language. It's found in Exodus 8. Uh, let me just give you a little background uh, to this text. Uh, in this part of Exodus, the Israelites have been living in slavery for a long time, uh, for centuries, and they want to be free. And so we have one of the great labor management conflicts of all time. Uh, the Israelites have a very bad contract. It's work and then die. Uh, Moses is their top union guy, but he doesn't have much leverage, and the rank and file is getting a little shaky. Uh, management is represented by Pharaoh, and he's a hardline negotiator. And so God gives Moses some very powerful bargaining chips known as the plagues to kind of level the playing field. In one of them, the water in Egypt turns to blood, so that the whole Nile River is filled with blood. Fish die, the stench spreads throughout the whole country. Other plagues involve gnats, flies, locusts, and boils. And in the midst of all of this, one of the most memorable plagues is written about in Exodus 8, uh, starting at verse 6. And Pharaoh's response to Moses is the key word that I want to focus on today. Exodus 8, 6. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your office, or officials and your people that you and your houses may rid, be rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. And so that's the word. Tomorrow. And I just want to ask Pharaoh one question. What are you thinking? Like, get the picture. The frogs are out of control. Look at Exodus 8, verse 3. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. Uh, Ken Davis puts it like this. Pharaoh can't even back his chariot out of his garage without killing a hundred frogs. His pizza is covered with frogs. If his home is anything like mine, his wife and oldest daughter have been standing on chairs screaming ever since the plague began. His youngest daughter has run out of jars to which she can collect and accidentally suffocate the frogs. The frogs are everywhere. Yet Moses, when Moses offers to get rid of them, what is Pharaoh's response? Tomorrow. Does he enjoy frog legs? Is the sound of his shrieking daughter like music to his ears? Is he tired of sleeping alone? Like what could possibly motivate this man to wait until tomorrow to resolve a problem that he could resolve today? Why spend another night with the frogs? If you look carefully, Pharaoh's behavior isn't too unusual. Uh, I've been there myself. I've done that. Uh, cancer ward residents continue to smoke cigarettes through the tracheotomy hole that's cut in their throats. Why? because the very habit that's killing them still provides a moment of pleasure. They settle for another night with the frogs. Intelligent people sacrifice reputation, health, their fortune to continue illicit relationships. They do this even when they know they'll be found out, even after the relationship turns sour, even after they've lost everything, they choose to spend another night with the frogs. A troubled young woman walked into my office one day. Her dilemma was this. She wanted her life to be lived in such a way that it pleases God, uh, but she was confused about what God wanted her to do. Her particular concern was about her relationship with her boyfriend. She had been dating this guy for about six months, and from the beginning of their relationship, he had been verbally and emotionally abusive. He was just a jerk to her. And her question to me was, should I continue to date this man? Will you be having frogs with that? Like, this kind of thing has puzzled the human race for a long time. The Greeks had a word for it. Uh, they called it akrasia. Uh, Greeks were big into reason. They valued reason very highly. Uh, they could not figure out why human beings chose to engage repeatedly 
in irrational acts that would not just harm other people, but destroy themselves. And so the Greeks called it akrasia. They said that the gods clouded human thinking, thinking and led them to do crazy things. An author named David Piers has written a book on the same subject. He calls this motivated irrationality. Motivated irrationality. People persistently tolerate and maintain behavioral patterns that will destroy their own lives. A husband holds a grudge against his wife. He withholds his love. He nurses his resentment. Even though he knows it's destroying his own heart, it's making him miserable, but he chooses to spend another night with the frogs. A sex addict keeps going back to the internet even though he knows it's destroying his marriage, his self-respect, and it's eating him up with guilt. A woman is sinking in unmanageable debt. Debt is destroying her life, but she goes out and gets another credit card for one reason, to get into more debt. Will you be having frogs with that? Moses said to Pharaoh, you don't have to live with the frogs anymore, Pharaoh. I have frog be gone. Like, you just say the word and their history. Just say the word. But Pharaoh says, but then I'll have to give up my labor force, and I'm not really ready for that. Maybe if I wait, the frogs will just go away. Like, maybe the frogs will hop to Assyria. Maybe the frog fairy will come and make them all go away. Pharaoh has learned that he can live with the frogs. He can tolerate a frog-saturated life. It's not a great life. There's not much joy in it, but he can survive. And he prefers it to the change that would be required in repentance. I'll just wait until tomorrow, he says. I think I can handle another night with the frogs. It may be the most dangerous word in the English language, tomorrow. We suffer from what might be called spiritual procrastination. Now, procrastination is not the same as physical laziness. Uh, you could be hyperactive and still be a procrastinator. Procrastination is the failure to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Like the kamikaze pilot who flew 17 missions. You have to kind of think about that one for a second. It's the failure to do the right thing at the right time. And just to level the playing field here, we're going to do kind of a mass confession on this one. I want to just run through a few categories. If as a student you've ever put off studying for an exam or writing a paper or maybe you've pulled an all-nighter, if you've ever put off a project around your house, if you've ever delayed in answering an email or paying a bill or returning a phone call or a text message, if your desk has any paperwork tucked away that you've been avoiding, if your desk is so full of paper that you can't even see your desk, um, if you were ever reminded by store ads to do your Christmas shopping in September, but you waited until November or December 24th. Um, if you've ever watched news crews interviewing people at the post office on April 15th at midnight and thought to yourself, I wish I had my taxes done on time like those people. If you've ever put off signing your kids up for a lesson or taking a trip, if you're still intending to have a talk with Junior about the facts of life, although Junior is now 40 years old and he has teenagers of his own, if you've ever put off going on a diet or doing home repairs or getting your oil changed or having your will written, seeing a doctor, if you've not made plans with your kids for Labor Day weekend yet, if you're not sure it's Labor Day weekend yet, if you're not sure you have kids, uh, if you've ever spent the night with frogs, how many of you, just a mass confession, would you raise your hand? I've procrastinated at least once in my life. How many of you say you want more time to think about it? It's an amazing thing how much damage this one trait can do. And for the most part, for most people, the problem is not that we don't know what to do. We know what to do. Our problem usually is not that we deliberately refuse to do what we shouldn't. Uh, that's why it's such an important issue for us. For most of us, our problem is not that we don't know what to do. Our problem is not that we deliberately refuse to do what we ought to do. We just don't get around to it tomorrow. Now, there are a variety of consequences to spiritual procrastination. Uh, there are external consequences. Uh, some of them get quite serious. This trait may cause you to mismanage finances, and that means that you will 
live in this constant state of financial pressure and never become a generous giver. Uh, or it may mean constant work problems, patterns of delay, trying to hide what's really going on, never realizing your full potential. In severe, severe cases, it's cost you your job. It can damage relationships. It can mean words of affirmation and love that never get spoken. It can mean conflicts that never get resolved or commitments that never get honored. It can cost friendships. It could damage the effectiveness of a parent. It can cripple a marriage. But then there are also internal consequences to this tomorrow syndrome. You can end up living with a constant anxiety that you're not able to meet a deadline. You just live with this level of stress that doesn't go away. You have a chronic sense of guilt because you know you're not doing what you should be doing. It erodes your sense of joy. It eats at your self-esteem. And the worst is it will keep you from ever realizing the purpose for which God created you. Not because you, never, you ever said no to God, but because you just said tomorrow. And so here's my question for you today. Where in your life are you saying tomorrow where God wants you to say today? Before you walk out of this room in a little while, I'd like for you to get real clear about that. Where in your life are you saying to God tomorrow where God is asking you to say today? In Hebrews 3.15, the writer says, Today, if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. When God calls today, and you don't respond today, it can lead to a hard heart. Today is all you've got. And so I want to spend our remaining time talking about a few areas where you might be putting up with some frogs. And I just want to ask you, as we walk through these areas, to do a little heart check. As we walk through each of these areas, ask, is God saying you're doing well in this area? You know, you're being responsive to God in this area? Or is God saying there's, some, there's something in this area that you actually need to take action on? And I'm going to ask you now, don't say tomorrow anymore. All right, the first area involves habits or negative behavioral patterns that God may want to change in your life? Do you have any habits or negative behavioral patterns right now that God might be bringing to your mind that you need to change? You know, these can have very severe consequences. Saul was called to be the first king of Israel. We're told in scripture that Saul stood head and shoulders above all of the men of Israel. He was called the glory of Israel uh, he had a heart for God. He prophesied. He was at least initially quite humble, uh, so humble that after his coronation, he went back to farming for a while. And then one day, after he had been king for a while, after a big battle, a young man named David became a hero. And the people sang a song as the troops were returning home. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And the writer of Scripture says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Saul was the king. Saul was God's anointed. When he saw David's giftedness, he could have befriended David. He could have trained David and helped him and been a mentor to him, but he didn't. From that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Envy started in Saul, and he just never dealt with it. Let me ask you a question. Did envy help Saul at all? Did it add to any joy in his life? Did it make him more effective as a king? Did it benefit any of his relationships? It destroyed him. I mean, it's crazy to live with envy. It destroyed his heart. It consumed him with anger. It drove him to attempt murder. It destroyed his relationship with his own son. He tried to kill his own son. It cost him the affection of his own people. In the end, it cost him his own crown, his throne, and his life. It cost him everything. So why didn't he do something about the envy that was corroding him and ultimately destroyed him? I'll tell you what I think. I think he chose, he, he chose, he, I don't think he chose deliberately to live with envy. I don't think Saul said to himself, now I'm intentionally going to develop a bitter, jealous heart. I don't think he did that. I think he just learned that he could live with it. There was never much joy in it, but he preferred it to the change that would be required with repentance. 
And so when little promptings came his way, when he was rebuked by Samuel, when David refused to try to retaliate, but instead showed mercy and grace to him, after a, a time you know, when the spirit was at work trying to appeal to Saul's conscience because he knew better, I think there was just something inside of him that said, not today. I'll repent tomorrow. I'm not going to fall on my knees today. I'd rather nurse the anger and bitterness and resentment inside of me than to be freed of it, than to have to go through the embarrassment and the pain of repentance. So not today. And he didn't repent that day or the following day. And the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months and months turned into years and it eventually killed him. And so I want to ask you, is there anything that has gotten hold of your heart? And you know right now it's a pattern, it's a habit, it's an attitude that is leading you away from God. And there's no joy in it. It's not creating a more loving, patient, peaceful, winsome, caring, serving person. It's making your heart a little colder and darker and harder every day. And at various points in your life, the Spirit maybe has attempted to convict you, but you just keep saying, not today. I'm not going to repent today. I'd prefer to live with this anger, with this resentment, with this bitterness, with this greed, with this envy, with this whatever it is, than to go through the pain of repentance. Not today. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe it's a pattern of deception, and the truth is you're just getting used to it. You've kind of begun to rely on it. Maybe it's addictive behaviors, maybe involving substance abuse or sex. Maybe it's a judgmental spirit that's getting a little stronger in you. It's a little stronger in you this year than it was last year. And if you don't do something, it's going to be a little stronger in you next year than it is this year until one day you just end up a Pharisee. Maybe you have a bitter heart towards someone. And it's a little, a little more bitter now than it was a month ago. And it's going to be a little more bitter a month from now. Maybe it's a spirit of discontentment inside of you that's just choking the gratitude out of you. Maybe it's a toleration of sin in some area. Listen, the writers of Scripture say, today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts. And I want to plead with you as earnestly as I know how, say before God and before yourself right now, I'm going to start working on this today. I'm not going to live under the illusion anymore that it'll go away tomorrow. I'll confess before God, I'll acknowledge it before another person, before a trusted friend, I'll start praying day by day for change in this area of my life. Whatever I need to do, I'll get the help that I need. Start reading relevant scripture passages and studying about change. Uh, memorize appropriate scriptures that relate to whatever it is that you need to change. See a Christian counselor if that's what you need to do. Talk to your small group about it if you need accountability but draw a line in the sand. Do it today. So that's the first area. Anything in your character, any kind of habits, any kind of behavioral patterns that need to change. Start today. The second area involves work. Does anyone here ever struggle with procrastination at work? I was thinking about this when I was putting this message together about an hour ago. One of the things the writer of Ecclesiastes says is, whatever your hand finds for you to do, do it with all your might. The Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Now, I know how this goes. All of us would love to be in a work situation where you go to work, you're just full of ideas and energy and motivation levels are peaking and you just can't wait to get at it. And sometimes that happens. But at least in my experience, a lot of times it doesn't. And a lot of times, all you can do is just discipline yourself. All I can do is just discipline myself and say, I'm going to study, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to think, and I'm going to write. And I can't control the outcome of my work, but God, you and I are going to be in partnership. And there's a part that God will do, and there's a part that I have to do. Here's what I've come to learn about work. Procrastination is a refusal to play my part in the partnership God wants to have with me. God wants to partner with you, whatever your work is, in your office, in, at home, uh, at school, whatever it is, God wants to be in partnership with you. 
but procrastination is the refusal to play my part, a refusal to play my part in the relationship that God wants to have with me. The outlet is your work or your office or home or desk or school. And I know how easy it is after a while to settle for less than working with all your might. Maybe it's a cynical attitude that goes unchecked. Maybe it's a spirit of complaint about your boss or a teacher. Maybe it's complaint about your company and it begins to infect the other people around you. Maybe you started to just kind of punch a clock and you just stopped growing. Maybe you're in the wrong job and you know you're in the wrong job and it doesn't fit the way that God has made you. You know, I was reading a Christian author recently about work and God's view of work and here's the phrase that I've never really thought about before. He talked about the sin of staying in the wrong job. In other words, if you know God has made you to do certain kinds of things, given you certain gifts and passions, and you're involved in an area of work, whether it's volunteer or for a paycheck or whatever it is, and it's not tapping into the thing that God made you to do, and you know it, and it would be possible for you to seek change, and you don't do that, you're violating stewardship. That's a sin that we don't talk about very much. But it really can be a violation of God's will. I know people who spend a year or a decade or sometimes a lifetime working in a job that doesn't match their gifts and their passion because they never got around to looking at something else. They just spend another day with the frogs for a whole career. And maybe God is saying to you, I want you to work diligently I want you to work diligently as if you're working for me. God's saying that to you because that's true. That's the reality. You are working for him. In Paul's uh, writings to slaves in his day, he says, work diligently as if you're working for the Lord. Maybe there are patterns in your life that you've been putting up with for so long, and it's time to change those. Well, change them. Start today. Okay, negative behavioral patterns is one area. Work is another area. The third area I want to talk about is finances. Writers of Scripture are quite clear that we're to be intentional and proactive in our financial lives. Uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. In other words, they have taken the initiative to get their financial lives in order and then they could be generous toward God's work. In the church, for followers of Jesus, Paul is saying we should not neglect giving or wise financial management and then get into crisis mode because we've put it off. There are many statements like this one in Proverbs. If a man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor, he too will cry out and not be answered. And many people manage, or I would say mismanage, their money in such a way that they have to shut their ears to the cry of the poor. They have no choice because they've mismanaged their finances so badly that they have nothing to give. And it's not because they said, I want to become a greedy person. It's not because they said, I never want to be able to give away, anything away. It's because they just said, you know what? I actually need to get my financial life in order. I'll do that tomorrow. I think of a couple I know who are very solid people. They're Christians. They've always been committed to the church and to ministry. Uh, they're very devoted parents. There's uh, just really one area of their lives where they've learned to live with the frogs, and it's this area of money. They consistently engage in patterns of spending that are not healthy. Uh, they're not accountable in their financial life to anyone. They don't plan. Uh, they're always spending on something. And they knew they ought to get disciplined in this area of their lives, but somehow they just never did. And sometimes they even laugh about it. It's almost an endearing quality to people who know them. People who know them know they're always ready for a party or a vacation. But the troubles got a little more serious every year, and financial pressures began to mount, and they made some unwise decisions, and they cut corners that they should not have cut, and then a crisis hit. And now they may lose their house. They may lose the company that they've built. They face legal actions. Their marriage is under horrible strain. It's not clear that it will survive. And you can imagine the effect something like this has on their kids. All because they just kept saying, okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll get around to honoring God with our finances. It was never a deliberate deception of disobedience. 
Not only is this creating tremendous destruction, but think about all of the good that could have been done. All the money that could have flowed through their hands over the years that could have been used for good. There's an organization called Opportunity International that works to end global poverty by creating and sustaining jobs. Uh, they provide small business loans and training for more than 14 million people in the developing parts of the world. They believe that empowering individuals to work their way out of poverty and to give their children a quality education is the most sustainable way to transform lives. And they're having a huge impact. And I read about a woman, it was a mom with small children, her whole world has changed because of $500 that was made available to her to start a business. And now she's supporting a family of small children. They have a home and they have health care and they have food and they have a sense of empowerment and self-sufficiency. Now over the last 10 years, this couple that I was telling you about, I mean, they could have done that gift 100 times over. There could be 100 families in places like Ecuador where we sponsor children through compassion that would be totally different today if that couple would have said, today's the day. From this day on, with God's help, things are gonna be different. Today, starting today, we're gonna get intentional about following Christ with our financial resources that he's given to us so that we can honor and glorify him and make a difference in the world. They never said that. They never said, we're gonna defy God in this area of our life. They never said, we're gonna mismanage our finances in a way that brings chaos into our home and threatens our integrity and jeopardizes our marriage and damages our children and dishonors God. They never said that. They just said tomorrow. I'm telling you, this, world, this word is lethal. It's amazing to me how many people know what's coming up in their financial lives. I know, they know their kids will grow up and need money for education. They know they're gonna retire. They know their resources could help people who are starving to death in developing parts of the world. And they never take a significant step toward a life of serious stewardship. Don't do that. Today, God may be talking to some of you about this area of your life. Maybe you need to sign up for Financial Peace University this fall. Maybe you need to meet with one of our financial mentors here at Blue Oaks. Maybe you need to get on a budget. Maybe you need to go home and cut up some credit cards. Get out the scissors. Maybe you need to set some goals for giving. Set them. No more frogs in this financial area of your life. All right, the last area. So negative behavioral patterns, work, finances, and then the last area I want to talk about is baptism. Uh, Scott mentioned earlier that Baptism Sunday is coming up in the next month or so, and I just want to talk to you about why it's important to, to take this step in your spiritual journey and why you should not put it off until tomorrow. Uh, baptism is really the initiation rite of the Christian faith. Uh, baptism is when you go public. It's one thing to say in the privacy of your own heart and home, I'm committed to Jesus. It's another thing to do what hundreds of people have done at Blue Oaks, which is to come forward in front of our church and to say through baptism, I'm a follower of Jesus, and this is the primary commitment of my life. You know, baptism was so important to Jesus that the very first thing he did before he began his public ministry was to be baptized. Before he turned water into wine, before he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fish, before he healed the sick and the lame, before he delivered the Sermon on the Mount, before he called his first disciples, Jesus was baptized. In his final instruction to his followers, Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptism was to be the first of many steps in the spiritual journey of following Jesus. And baptism became the practice and the pattern in the early church. You know, when 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, all 3,000 were baptized that day. When an Ethiopian official had the gospel explained to him by Philip, uh, they came to some water, and the Ethiopian asked to be baptized right there. Look at uh, Acts 8. Luke says this. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? There are nine conversion stories recorded in the book of Acts. Every one of them begins with a person putting their faith in Jesus Christ, and everyone ends 
with this visual, vis visual expression of, of baptism by that person. You know, some of you were baptized as babies or as children, and you may think, you know, I don't need to be baptized again. Others of you have received, uh, recently decided to follow Jesus, and you wonder how much you need to know. Like, how much do I need to know about the faith, or how much do I need to learn uh, before taking this step and being baptized? What do the writers of Scripture say about this? I want to look at a couple examples of the progression of events in the Bible. The first is from Acts 8.13. Luke says, Simon himself believed and was baptized. So you notice the progression. He first believed and then he was baptized. And another example is from Acts 18. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. You notice the pattern. They first believed and then they were baptized. That's the pattern that we find consistently in the New Testament church. People would first put their faith in Jesus, and then they would express it publicly with baptism. You know, when a couple gets married, they look each other in the eye and they express their vows of love and devotion. And then they mark the significance of those vows by exchanging rings with each other. The rings come after the vows. The symbol comes after the commitment. Baptism is only significant after a person makes a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. So once you come to faith, you don't have to spend time getting your spiritual act together or your spiritual life together before you take that public step through baptism. Waiting until we grow up in the faith is not a requirement of baptism. The simple requirement is to be a follower of Jesus. The requirement is that we have genuinely put our trust in Jesus. Now, what if you put your faith in Christ like, five years ago or 15 years ago, but you haven't taken this step yet, either because maybe no one taught you about it or maybe you've just been putting it off. I think when you understand that you need to be baptized after coming to faith in Jesus, you just follow. You just go ahead and do it. Whether you made the decision five months ago, five years ago, or 50 years ago. Maybe your parents had you baptized when you were a baby or very young. I know that's true for many of you. Um, and you may think, well, isn't that good enough? Often parents want their children baptized primarily as a sign of their dedication and commitment to God, expressing their intent that one day they hope this child becomes a follower of Jesus. And if your parents did that for you, I think their motivation was pure and it was in the right place. You ought to be thankful for their spiritual concern. You ought to express gratitude to them for that. But at the same time, if you look at what the writers of Scripture say, baptism always came after someone came to faith. And if you decide to be baptized as an adult because you've come to your own sense of faith now, that doesn't repudiate the baptism that you received as a child. You can kind of view it as a fulfillment of your parents' wishes and their prayer that you would follow Jesus one day on your own. Now, if you've reached a point in your life where you've made your own decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you need to follow his example and express your decision through baptism. So what are you waiting for? You know, people go through years, sometimes decades, waiting. You know, I'll follow God through baptism tomorrow. Maybe you've been putting it off, saying, you know, someday, someday I'm going to take Jesus seriously on the whole baptism deal. Someday I'm really going to follow in this step because I see other people do it and I want that kind of joy that they've experienced. You know, someday I'll do that. And someday never comes around. And then they die. And they never said, I'm going to go through my life with my heart shut off to God in this area. I'm going to defy God. I'm going to disobey him in this area of my life. I'm going to be so preoccupied that I never make this a priority. They never said that. It just happens. Because they never said, I'm making the decision today. You know, if God is speaking to you about being baptized I just want to ask you to check the box on your next step card. And I want to ask you to, you know, fill that out. Put your name and your phone number on there because I'd like to give you a call this week and talk to you about it. Well, Blue Oaks, you know, this is your day. This is our day. Others have gone before us. Others will come after us. But you have this day. You have today. So don't say tomorrow. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. All right, let me pray as the band comes to lead us in the closing song. 
God, we're so thankful for the Holy Spirit that's here in this room, that's as close as our own bodies, as close as the air we breathe. Thank you that you're in our lives and that you convict us and that you guide us and you direct us, you move us in directions where we should go. And I pray that those of us who are putting something off, um, whether it has to do with a negative behavioral pattern in our lives or work or um, any, there's so many different areas where we could be saying tomorrow to you where you want us to say today. I pray that by your spirit, you would just continue to convict us in that area so that we, um, we start living in this way that you want us to live that really will lead to the kind of joy and fulfillment that we're longing for. And I pray that you would give us the encouragement and the motivation to keep moving in that direction. And I ask it in Jesus' name.